Okay, now we're going to start with an addendum to the 14 uh, parts. So I'm going to call this, I guess, 14B, so it'll still say 14. Of another keyword I just found after starting the 14 <laughs> parts videos. And it's not going to be easily recognized as a keyword because it's used so often in the Bible, New Testament in particular, and the the right hand corner you see the lexicon here. The word is apocrites. That's the participle form. Here's the vocabulary form apocrinomai. Okay? And yes you say I not A. It's not K like in modern Greek today. It's I. How do I know that? And you can talk to any linguist about this. All verbs initially were short. Long vowels, I mean vowels. Long, short vowels. Every language on the planet initially had short vowels. Long vowels are the product of later speech. Okay? So that would have been a. Ah, and that would have been e. Ka e. Okay? This will end up lengthening out. So you end up saying kai. Kai. See how that works? Kai. Ai. Same thing is true when you're looking at the old the Hebrew text. They don't even show the vowel points in the original. Alright, but in like the Middle Ages they came up with an added vowel points for those who weren't familiar with the tact you know, with the pronunciation. And even in the in those things, you you trace the, the sound changes. And it goes from short to long. This is technically called a diphthong. And you got two vowels together. And that's one of the reasons why they became long. So we have father and feather. Feather. Okay, it sounds almost like it's Irish, but it's actually E A. Okay? So we might say fe, but you can't really, sp the spelling will never just be one letter, okay? We say baseball, but that's really because the base is got other letters after it, okay? It's, it's you know, I don't want to get into into the weeds with you guys, but it's really important to understand that this pronunciation is what it is. And that's key to the metering, too. And what one of the things about this meter is going to end up being true, that you're going to find out, is it's preserving the pronunciation of the words. So each writer has a sort of a particular style of writing that will tell you the pronunciation, which you learn from the meter. And in, in Matthew's case, he tends to truncate, like, I... I, I, I. That's the same sound in Hebrew, so it's not going to change. All right. So it's apo krinomai. Okay. Now they didn't have in the actual original text. They don't have these little like markers on top of the letters. That was added later. Again, as a pronunciation aid. Now the reason why I know apokrinomai turns out in Matthew 24 and 25 to be a keyword is what it means. Apo means out from the source of. And krinomai really means to judge. A formal judgment, a formal opinion, a formal ruling. It comes to mean answer, but it's got a sort of formal connotation to it which Freiburg tends to recognize is a Freiburg lexicon, somewhat formal response. Okay? And then this is Bauer Danker, which goes into much more detail. Okay? You can look all this up on the internet. You don't have to rely on what I'm telling you, but I'm getting this from Bible works. This is the Gingrich lexicon, which I don't pay much attention to. This is Freiburg, which a lot of people pay attention to, but I'm not all that keen on it. It's all right. BDAG is considered one of the, you know, primary 
better lexicons. And if you want it in Bible works, you have to pay extra, but it just seamlessly is in there once you pay for it. Okay? And it's like answer, reply, give an opinion, and then all these verses that have it are listed. Okay? And then it gives you the Hebrew equivalents so that you can test it in the Old Testament. Like this one, Ana. That has a connotation of a formal answer also. It's got, it's got a, a connotation of an authority speaking. Well, if you're giving your opinion, you're an authority on your own opinion. It's got that kind of context. So it's not just answer. It's not just reply. It's got a formal, I am making a formal ruling position statement. And since this is the Lord talking, that kind of matters. Alright? Now... As you can see, it's got a lot of usage in the Bible. This, this, I did a search just on the Gospels. Actually, only on three of them. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Alright, so you see, it's got a lot of uses. And if you were to actually, I mean, there's 131 verses here. If you were to actually search it pan Bible, you would have thousands of uses of it. So now we have to prove why it's a keyword. From the standpoint of, well, it's so common, brain. Now, how do you know it's a keyword? So we first go to Matthew 24, where it occurs. And we find out, well, okay, it might be a common keyword. Matthew sure has used it a lot. But when we get to 24, he's only using it here. And that's obviously a judgment. And here, that's obviously an official warning. And here, hopefully you're looking at the right-hand screen when you say that. Okay? That isn't even him talking. But what's interesting about that particular item is the word apekritesan, which is spoken by the prudent virgins. They're virgins, not bridesmaids. They're saying there's not enough for us in use because in the previous verse, the foolish virgins wanted to take some of the prudent virgins' oil. Prudent really means wise. And so the, the wise ones are saying back, no, it's not going to be enough for both of us. You're going to have to go get your own. All right? Where it says right here, Apocrino, right up here, in the unreadable, light blue, dark blue, which is the same as stupid Adobe uses. See this word here? That is World War One. The syllable counts started, the, the last prior syllable count to this one was 1884 plus 30 equals 1914. So we saw before, up here, look, he's saying, not one stone, another torn down. Okay, that's obviously temple down. That's obviously a judgment. That obviously happened in 70 AD. And when he's saying it, He's saying it, at, it, it ends up being at 40 syllables. See? Right here. Well, actually, that's the decree of it. The actual occurrence, see, here's 40. 40 years from now, temple's going to go down. And then here's the decree saying it, but it's got a double entendre because 84 years from when he talks, something called the Quitos War is going to happen, which is about the temple being down. They want it back up again. And that started in uh, northern Africa, and it kind of spread. And it's basically why Jerusalem would end up being raised, and then Jews aren't even allowed to live there anymore. And in those days, Jews equaled Christians. And the Romans didn't distinguish. If you were think, thought of as a Jew, uh, but you were really a Christian, you were considered a Jew anyhow, and vice versa. Okay, so no stone left on another. All right? And that's 44 years after he talks. I mean, 80, 84 years after he talks. It's 40 years after he talks, so it's 40 syllables. You see, it's real deliberate. This is why the syllable counting is so important to understanding what the Bible is actually saying. Especially in a passage like this, which is time prophecy. Alright, no stone left down. Alright, so... His answer, however, to them started right here. In answering, he said, that's 40. 
just before the word apocrites occurs. Ho makes it syllable 41. Da and apocrites are one syllable because you can't say da apocrites without sounding drunk. So you got to run them together. Da apocrites. Okay, so that's 42. Syllable 42. Now if you look up in your history, you find out that the battle, the first Jewish war, was from 66 to 73 A.D. 66 to 73 A.D. Troops started coalescing around Jerusalem in 66 A.D. And, and Nero had hired Vespasian to do that. Vespasian was up north in, I want to say Germany or somewhere. And Nero was in uh, Greece. And he calls Vespasian and his family, and, and Vespasian's family really didn't get along too well. But he said, look, Vespasian, I want you going down to Jerusalem, which was considered the armpit of the universe, bad duty. And I want you to quell those Jews. Vespasian did it. But it, it took the actual war itself, was on again, off again, siege again, non-siege again, trying to be nice because Jerusalem was the center of commerce. And they didn't want to just run it over. Because it's like, you know, we can get taxes from it, we get tribute from it, we get trade duties from it. You know, we want to keep it a going concern. So it took a long time. Well, by here, 72, because it's syllable 42, so I add 30. 72 is when things got really heated. The temple had already gone down in 70. And then you have Masada finishing it off in 73. But then you have the aftermath. You have the triumph, which is occurred right here at the hole. That's after the temple went down. But there was a lot of mopping up to do afterwards. It didn't just end. And then you had all those people who were still in the land and how do you rebuild all the destruction that occurred. And what about getting commerce ready again? Well, Apocrites, therefore, has this connotation of disaster. Very obvious disaster. So that would be four that would be seventy two, forty two syllables plus thirty, three, four, and five. Forty two, forty three, forty four, forty five. Tapocrites. Okay, so that was years seventy two, seventy three, seventy four, seventy five. Okay? So, whatever apocrites is going to mean as a keyword later, this is what's set in the tone. Disaster, destruction of a people, or a group, or a place. Okay? So now we come back here, and we see the next time it's used is in verse 4. Warning you against being misled. And that takes place Oops, let me. That takes place right here. See, here's a face again. And that corresponds to the year. See, you got. It ends at 1580, um, 159. It starts at 148, though. So you got Chi in syllable 148. So now this is syllable 149, which stands for 179, okay? And so it's 179, 80, 81, 82. And you know what that stands for? That stands for commonest. Now here, there are a bunch of things that start happening in 79, 179. <clears throat> you have a plague. You have a final sort of campaign against the Germans. Our boy um, Marcus Aurelius gets sick for a while. And he dies the following March. Commodus, meanwhile, has already been appointed his heir apparent, unlike the movie Gladiator. The movie Gladiator has it wrong. Commodus had been appointed since he was five years old to be the heir apparent of Marcus Aurelius. The movie reverses that, pretends that that's not true. But history tells us otherwise. When Commodus was five years old, his dad, Marcus Aurelius, said, okay, my son's going to be the next emperor. And then Commodus spent his whole life with his dad. And here his dad is dying and Commodus is going to take over. 
Commons turns out to be one of the worst emperors Rome ever had. Very much like Donald Trump. Very much like Donald Trump. And if you took away the hair from Commodus and you just saw the way he acted and talked and the things he did, it'd be really hard to tell the difference between him and Trump. Really hard. The only possible difference is that Commodus was real loyal to his wife. Okay? From what I can tell. So, apocrites then means judgment. Disaster on a people. Again, only well, this time the people is Rome, and it's visited upon the people by a different Roman emperor. You see the, the tie? It's a parallelism. Okay, so now we come to the next one, which I had shown you earlier, which is up here in Matthew 25, 9. So if the next one doesn't occur until Matthew 25, 9, See, here it is, 25-9. That's World War I. Where that word apokrites again, but it's now five syllables, apokritesan. Apokritesan. When that starts, that's World War I. Okay? World War I. And you can call that a judgment and a disaster, couldn't you? All over the world. Alright, it really wasn't the first world war we ever had. The first world war we ever had was the War of Austrian Succession, which I'll be getting to. Um, if, I, if you haven't watched the videos already, I'm going to be covering that. But, that's disaster. World War I are the syllables covered. 1914, 1918, 1915, 1918. And it wasn't just automatically over in 1918 when they signed the armistice. Okay, there was still little conflicts and aftermaths going on. And in many ways, many historians will tell you that really World War I didn't end until the end of World War II. Okay, so I, that's, a, that's a judgment. Okay, but here's the next one. Matthew twenty-five twelve. I don't know you. And guess where that occurs? Right in our future. See? And answering... Seven year period, tribulation, sound familiar? And what year is that at its end? 2030. This is 2023. This is where we are now. And it's denouncing. Kyrie, Lord, Lord. Yeah, who are they calling Lord? Not the real one. This is about the apostasy of Christianity. It has to be answered just as the apostasy of the Jews had to be answered just as the nastiness of Rome had to be answered because after all, they're the ones that took the temple down. It wasn't God's fault it went down. All right? So, 25-9... That's an answer, too, only it wasn't God technically speaking here. It's the wise ones. If they're wise because they're full of the Spirit. See, a lion, they have oil. Oil always signifies the Holy Spirit. Okay? And they're saying to the, to the foolish ones who want to take their oil, because, oh, our lamps are going out. Yeah, you're dying because you're foolish. But you want to take what, you, what I have for you... No, go get your own. So you can see why that would provoke a war. And that's exactly how World War I, why it started. The real reason why it started. Everybody made treaties with everybody else so they could take from the other guy in case something happened. So when something happened, everybody's trying to take something from the other guy. Could this be a better satire than what he says here? Answering him, the, the wise virgin said, Hey, no, never, because then there won't be enough for both of us. So you go away, and this is where World War II starts. So when historians say, I almost, I could just blow up when I see this. Historians commonly say, well, World War II was the end of World War I, not World War I in 1918. Yeah, and this sentence is basically saying the same thing. Because look, it's, it's part of the whole same sentence. 
Okay? And answering and answering the wise virgin said, Hey, there ain't gonna be enough for both of us. Go out and buy your own. Now what's really interesting about this is that this ends up being the time when our best scholarship but remember all these lexicons I showed you? Okay, when I was doing the, the thing with the you know, Freiburg, Bowered Anchor, all these guys. There, the best scholar work was being done during that time, mostly after World War One, between before World War Two. Okay, especially Del Scott, Thayer. Okay, this stuff was all being collated. So we had just found in the late eighteen hundred, late eighteen hundreds, a bunch of Bible manuscripts. So do you wonder why there'd be war here? And how do I know we found those manuscripts? Well, that's what this is, to Numphias. Every single one of these entries has to do with some Bible manuscript that gets found during that time. Which is interesting because this, 1946 plus 30, is 1974 through 76. Well, what Bible manuscript got found? Well, more of them at St. Catherine's Monastery. Because everybody disputes those. We call it Codex Sinaiticus. A lot more of them are there. And they're even doing some digging now. And that might explain why we got Curios used as a synonym for Nufias, Bridegroom, Lord. Going on right now in our time, there might be some digging going on somewhere. And they just haven't made it official yet. But it would have started, if this is true, this would be 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018. <clears throat> and it might include this meter too. I don't know. My saying it doesn't make it happen. It's going to have to be somebody with initials after his name. But, you know, anybody can count the syllables, so. though. If you start hearing about this from somebody famous, well, then you'll know. Oh, that's the Courier in Matthew 25, 11. Oh, okay. But there's some kind of Bible manuscript, Bible translation, Bible something that's really important going on right now. And the one before that was Codex Sinaiticus. Of new, new pieces of it. Because there's more than one copy. And that's what this is here. And that's what that is there. It's kind of related. It's not exactly Sinaiticus itself. But this is when the, the, the collection begins. Okay, because it wasn't just Sinaiticus by this point. It was Sinaiticus, Vaticanus. We found all kinds of manuscripts starting here. And so starting here, we had a fake bridegroom coming up too. Joseph Smith. And that was his first vision. And then Joseph Smith coming up again. You know how he liked all those women. So it's kind of funny to call him bridegroom too. You always got a false Christ and a real Christ. Remember? I don't know if you've seen those videos yet. But starting right here. In 1640, 1642. When our boy Charles, son of James I, gets deposed because he doesn't want people to interpret the Bible for themselves. And England says to him, sorry, we'd rather have the real Lord instead of you. So they deposed him. And then came Oliver Cromwell, and then finally they came to their senses. But the next king didn't bother trying to tell them how to learn their Bible. And the U.S. came out of that, by the way. Alright, so down here is the same thing. Battle for the Austrian succession. Technically, that battle was over whether or not, whether or not, the lady who was to inherit the Holy Roman Empire from her newly dead dad, whether she could do that because she didn't have a husband. Is the Lord clever or not? You know, that's really cute to time it there. Because in Greek, you don't have to put these words in this order. He could have put it in any order. Alright, and then of course this is our boy Joseph Smith's first vision. And then we have his official start with, with Mormonism. Contrasted with actual findings of the real Lord's manuscripts versus 
Here, where Smith says, oh, I found some brass plates. Yeah, that's when, that's when, uh, Tischendorf finds the real, real Bible. Yeah, versus your stinking brass plates, which are just slapstick comedy when you read them. Okay, and then we got it here, and that's where it's getting a little too painful and close. 1974-76, well, you know, you don't discover a manuscript in just one day. It was brought to public attention in 1975, but they would have had to have been, you know, looking for it and coding over it and deciding what it really was for a while before. And then you have the, you know, dissemination aftermath. And you know what else that stands for as far as our false Christ? The rise of Ronald Reagan. Yeah. Yeah. And and back here, back here, right up here, that's 1960, just this one here. Okay, that's the rise of the silent majority and Jerry Falwell deciding the Bible wasn't good enough. I want to make a political Christianity, so I'm going to invent the lie that, that abortion is murder. Because that had never been said before. And he tried to get the backing of Nixon, but Nixon couldn't quite get elected until eight years later. Because Kennedy was so popular then. And then he did the same thing with Ronald Reagan, who said, oh, I'll listen to you, and then as soon as Ronald Reagan gets in power, he doesn't. Oh, yeah, abortion's bad, yeah, 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 and then they do nothing about it. And then the same thing with the Bushes right here. They publicly said they weren't going to do anything about it. So by now, the stinking politicizing Christians, this is Jerry Falwell Jr. right here, 2015, backing Trump, Oh, Lord, Lord, yes, in Trump we trust, book by Ann Coulter, Cheeto Jesus, and all these Lord memes that just flame over Twitter. None of them knowing about that prophecy you see there outlined in black. And now that jerk is elected as an alternate Lord to the real one, and some kind of manuscripts or some kind of massive Bible improvement thing is going on right under our nose as we speak, and I don't know what it is. So what's going to have to happen to get rid of these politicizing Christians? The Lord is going to answer. Now what kind of answer is that going to be? Well, compared to World War I, doesn't sound like it's going to be very good. Compared to the reign of Commodus, okay, the reign of Commodus, because the last time it was used was back up here. This was the reign of Commodus, so the answering could be a really bad Caesar, a really bad ruler. We got one just elected. But he's so old, I, can't, I have a hard time believing he's going to live that long. But it could be one of his kids. Alright. That's bad. And before that, Temple Down. So whatever this is up here, that's going to start happening in 2024. Honey, it has to be public and it has to be bad. Don't you think? Now. I think that's the last use of Apocrites. Ah, no, it's not. There's another one upcoming in 2509 A.D. I have no idea how to even tell you what that is. That's too far removed from my current. But somebody in the future will be knowing about this meter and they'll know what it is. Okay? And then we got another one coming up a lot. Another one coming up, you know, by 28-29-07. So they're coming up with some regularity here. See, that's 2509. That's 2907. And then there's another one coming up around the year 3000, 2990, you know, by then. So what is that going to be? Well, I don't know if this one's going to be bad because the text that goes with, see, is I'm in Lego Homing again. So it's public and it's some kind of fight. But 
how bad is it going to be? Maybe it's a fight, all right, but maybe it's real obvious that the believers are vindicated. Because at this point, it's really dicey. Once you get past this period, 26, let's see, where is it? Yeah, once you get past this, it it's real dark and stark. All the language in here is all about all oh, the Lord is appearing to everybody. Everybody can see him from east to west. It's all very second advent language. Which implies that it's actually the millennium. Which it could be. But it could also just be, hi, scripture so available now. It's as if you don't need the second advent. You can see me face to face. Just look at it. But they don't. This one is definitely bad. Okay. Because this is the Lord replying to them, saying, Oh, we were good. When did we ever see you hurt or sick? And, and you know, see, here he is talking to him again. Uh-oh. I didn't note that one. So, I'll have to put it there. All right. See, they answer and he answers. It's very antiphonal at this point. Kind of like Genesis 1 was, you know, when, when the judgment was announced. And when God talked to Cain and Cain talked back to God. Cain basically means acquirer, by the way. His nickname actually means spear, and I'll leave you to guess what that means, since he was the first boy born. Um, so whatever these are, they're not good. These are going to be public, but I don't know how bad they are because they seem to be a vindication of believers. But I'm too far removed from it to be able to tell you what this is. But you can say something about the character because of the past. So I can say something about the character of what's upcoming in 2030 because of the past. World War One, Commodus, and Temple Down are our three examples every time this keyword is used. So what conclusions do you draw? Well, I've drawn mine. Let me hear from you.